But I think it's important to ask yourself, like when you see, say, Canada, Canada's government um, doing tyrannical things, tyrannical behaviors, like like when they froze the bank accounts of the peaceful protesters um, or, or the people who donated to to the peaceful protest, ask yourself, like, where were the leaders of your country? Were they criticizing Justin Trudeau? Were they calling him out? Because typically, you know, you would expect them, if, if they don't agree with something, that they would call it out and say, hey, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. But almost no one, I mean, Bukele was one of the only world leaders that I saw who actually, I mean, there were a few politicians in Europe or other places, but but not leaders, not world, not no, national just, leaders calling no, them out. So, so, yeah. so, okay, if, if you have a similar situation in your country, then what, what are your leaders going to do? And I, I suspect that, you know, similar things will happen in Europe. And, and we, we could go on a whole rabbit trail about CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and how those are being developed all over the world. And they're going to give all kinds of power to governments to, uh, to, basically restrict your freedoms and take them away and so so yeah i would say that if you're in a developed country it's especially uh dangerous because it's just so much more advanced down that path whereas in a developing country i think it's less likely to happen um it's just not there yet technologically speaking and yeah and and but as far as like seeing a future of parallel um, societies parallel economies I, I really hope that that's the case and I I don't know that it's gonna be countries that that lead the way like I wanted to mention this earlier like when I went to the adopting Bitcoin conference here in San Salvador in November there were some awesome presentations from different projects happening around the world so there's there's here the Bitcoin is happening like top down right government is is spearheading it and but it started out with a bottom up movement right it was bitcoin beach and el zante that inspired the country to do that and similar projects are happening like bitcoin beach has inspired projects all over the world so in south africa in um, guatemala in costa rica mm -hmm. uh, there's a the bitcoin project happening in honduras and prospera there's there's all kinds of projects happening and and they're happening from the ground up and so i hope that that will inspire similar things like it did in el salvador where the government will see the value of that and, and support it but it may not it might need to be a bottom-up movement right and and it may need to be just the people doing it kind of you know even without the support of their government and and i think we need to do that i think we need to create that parallel economy um whether or not the government is supportive of it we need to all of us, all of us need to start using Bitcoin, start sending payments to each other in Bitcoin, start using Lightning wallets. And, you know, like if you're transferring 20 bucks to your friend to pay them back for dinner, use use Bitcoin, use Lightning. Tom, Emily, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. No, thank you. My pleasure. Um, so listen, um, I'm really looking forward to the chat. Um, I've already already talked to um, the you know the two people in in what's the what's the handle? What's the Twitter Paradise. handle? Two people in paradise. We exactly, yeah, two people in paradise. Yeah. I always forget the yeah. Twitter Our handle. Friends. Exactly, and they uh, yeah they gave me their inspiring story and very empowering, very encouraging. So uh, so I'm I'm doing a series of 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 talks, you know, with with people like you, you know. Um, Coincidentally, you know, you, you're also now from Canada. Um, but yeah, um, um, again, you know, the reason I, I want to talk to you about this is that um, me, my girlfriend and our now two year old daughter, she had birthday yesterday. Uh, we, we, we are planning to seriously pack our stuff when this, you know, this whole shit got serious in Austria with vaccine. They repealed the law already, you know, but uh, as you know, they wanted to sort of force vaccinate the people. And I want to, you know, also t have your take, Emily, because you're a, uh, uh, you've been fired, you know, as a nurse, right, in Canada. Uh, yeah. I also want to know your your take, your general position, like on because my my general position on vaccination changed dramatically after this because I wasn't like anti-vax at all. I have like like three yeah. vax passes for general, you know, vaccinations because I went right. back and forth to United States and Austria and have like so many vaccinations. I mean, I'm, I'm sometimes I wonder why I'm still alive, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> well, actually. <I'm> a... <laughs> 
Anyway, so why don't you just go ahead, either Tom, Emily, uh, tell us your story, and and then we can go, you know, deeper down the rabbit hole. So, yeah, it's interesting that you would say that about vaccines because I feel the same way. Like I, yeah. I've always been, you know, in my twenties, I traveled all around the world, probably thirty countries, and I got all kinds of vaccines in order to do that. And you know, we had our children vaccinated. Our oldest is nine now, and we have three. And, uh, they, you know, they're all up to date on their shots. And yet, in the last couple of years, our our uh, views of vaccines has dramatically changed. Well, uh, I would say we're, we're questioning things that least, we didn't question before. You know? yeah, we, um, yeah, we started questioning a lot, you know, a lot more about pharmaceuticals and, you know, what the agenda really is and how safe these things really are and that sort of thing. But yeah, so to to tell our story, <clears throat> because probably a lot of your listeners, viewers haven't, you know, don't know who we are. Um, so we were sort of, a, I guess, a typical Canadian family living in British Columbia, Canada, so on the West Coast. Uh, we were in the northern part in a, in a relatively small city, Prince George, which has about 90,000 people. It's 800 kilometers north of Vancouver. And we, yeah, we had a great life there. We, we owned our own home with almost half an acre, big yard. We, we loved the place. We, we loved our home. We, mm -hmm. you know, had big gardens and, um, playground in the back for our kids. And they, they loved that house. And, and we had our kids in a fantastic school private school yeah that we loved and we had a great community of, mm -hmm. of family and friends and and so we had no reason to want to leave prior to covid you mm -hmm. know we we hadn't even really been thinking about it. we'd always want to take our kids traveling but but the thought of just moving out of canada wasn't even on the radar really at the time yeah. um but yeah so then so then i guess uh then covid started and you know we we kind of went along we're not sure what to think and, and so we mm -hmm. took the same precautions that most people did and i still remember uh, leaving my uh, amazon orders or grocery bags outside for a little while you know because <laughs> i read that that helps like the covid go away before you bring them in the house and things like that <laughs> and it sounds ridiculous now thinking about it yeah and i remember going to work as a nurse because i i was caring for the elderly in a nursing home i remember just having so much fear that I would be bringing COVID into my workplace or that I might be bringing it back to my family because the fear was, the fear mongering <laughs> was very strong at the time. But, but so, yeah, I mean, uh, a few months into it or maybe less time than that, we really started to question things and, you know, things weren't adding up to us. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, like once the, the vaccine stuff started to roll out and, I just thought right away, well, I'm I'm going to be the last person to get this thing because because I'm at low risk. I'd read the statistics for men under 40 and I just thought, well, I'll, I'll other people can get this and I'm just going to wait and see. And I didn't think anything nefarious at the time, but um but then when, you know, like Canadian politicians were saying we're not going to mandate this, we're not going to bring in uh discriminatory vaccine passports or like our prime minister and our chief health officer for our province both said they weren't going to do that and then so that was in the spring of 2021 but it, by the summer of 2021 it started to get pretty dark in Canada and I know what you mentioned about Austria I remember reading the article that they were talk, talking about jail time for people who refused it which was incredibly scary and we thought that was going to come to Canada too they were they were running polls like the mainstream media in Canada was having polls uh asking Canadians what should we do with the unvaccinated and the options were deny them health care, put them in jail, or I think it was, or nothing. And so they were, they were inciting fear and anger towards people who, you know, made a different medical choice. And it was a, it was a scary time in Canada for sure. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. I just wanted to add to that, that, you know, they kept saying, if you're not vaccinated, you're going to spread the virus. You're a super spreader. You know, they put labels on us. And you're selfish. You're not thinking about the whole. You're not thinking about great grandma that could die if you bring the virus to her. Even if you don't have symptoms, you could spread it if you don't take this vaccine, right? But, but yeah. So, I mean, 
I feel like I don't want to go too in the weeds on, <laughs> on COVID because we, yeah. we all know, I think all your viewers know about COVID, but like yeah, Canada yeah. basically went crazy. Um, by the summer of 2021, it was in full swing. Like we were, we were at protests in Canada, um, freedom rallies and protests against the healthcare workers being fired yeah. for not getting the vaccine. And so we were there fighting this and, and we could see that the, the tide was like overwhelmingly against us. Mm. And that it was just, you know, this tidal wave was just coming and, and we just had to get out of the way. And and we saw that, you know, they were bringing in, um, they were firing Emily. They were bringing in these vaccine passports so that we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't take our kids to any activities or restaurants or, or anything like that. And then we we're going to be denied public transportation and also locked into our own country, unable to leave, which was the yeah. scariest thing of all, right? Prisoners in your own country. But it was also... Um, really hard, you know, having three little girls and telling them all the time why they couldn't do normal things like, you know, go to the public swimming pool or sign up for dance class or, you know, their normal skating lessons, all the, all the things that they enjoyed were being taken away from them. Yeah. And it, it was just breaking our hearts. Well, that we had to tell them these things every day. And even, yeah. even getting invited to a birthday party where, only vaccinated parents could bring the children to this birthday party. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, we were being vilified, um, yeah. not only by the government and the media, but even um, family and friends, some yeah. turned yeah, against This is the most traumatizing thing I've seen and uh, yeah. observed and experienced. Uh, we, we all, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to also ask you, like, because you, you have three wonderful children, like daughters, right? We have one daughter. So, uh, like, how they, but you already answered that, like, uh, how they, how, how did they experience it, this whole environment? This, I mean, this, <laughs> and it's mind boggling. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the psychological, emotional, and, and I don't know, maybe even physical, psychosomatic, uh, you know, consequences. Uh, because mm -hmm. of these measures or, or, or dictatorial measures, it's it's mind boggling. It's really mind boggling. I, I, it is. I yeah. think I think it was a bit traumatic for them, you know, yeah. like because they were going to school and you know it started like this is uh, over a year ago now. It started where you know their classmates were talking about how you know my mommy and daddy are vaccinated. Are your mommy and daddy? Because if they're not, they're not safe, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But but I would say that like the first two years, like from whatever, March 2020 to or a year and a half to the summer of 2021, although it was difficult, um, it, everyone was more or less being treated the same. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was when that division started to be created where there's like two classes of citizens, right? Yeah. There's the ones who did the right thing. And there's the bad, the bad ones, right? The <laughs> evil ones and who don't care and who aren't willing to do what it takes for the greater good. And all these sort of uh, <laughs> things that were said about us, it, that's when it became really difficult, right? Because, because as long as everyone was banned from going to restaurants, uh, it, it wasn't so hard to, to explain to our children. We could say, oh, we don't agree with this, but th these are the policies. These are the rules for everyone right oh, now. Yeah. But when it became we're not allowed to go to any of these places because of our choice then that and it was put on us and we were told like well it's your own choice you're choosing to lose your job you're choosing to be banned from restaurants because you're making the wrong choice and it was amazing how people were able to justify that and that's when it became really difficult for me to like explain to our daughters that that like how can i explain to them that that this makes sense and 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 we couldn't, we like, we couldn't justify this to them. And that's why we began to put the bug in their ear early that we wanted to take them traveling. We wanted to take them around the world. I remember buying a world map and we would, my oldest daughter and I, we would like put uh, stickers on the map of all the places we wanted to visit. And so we started to build up this excitement about leaving Canada mm -hmm. because we knew already in early summer, 2021, that this was a possibility. Mm -hmm. And, and so that helped, I think, because they would ask all the time, when are we going to go on our trip around the world? When are we going to do this? And and it was actually a dream of ours to take our kids traveling, especially to Latin America. So this is this had always been a dream of ours. Um, I mean, we didn't expect so it to happen the way it did. We just always had excuses like, oh, <laughs> we have a house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, so I guess um, to finish our sort of story of, mm -hmm. of how we ended up leaving Canada was 
the, the <laughs> there's a few things, but but basically there was an election in Canada in September 2021. We were hopeful that the government would change and that you know, things might change course. Uh, that didn't happen. And so we saw that the current prime minister uh, could be in power for another four years. Mm -hmm. And he had already vilified us and threatened to take away our right to leave the country. And so right after that, you know, it was like, okay, we seriously need to look at leaving. But but we weren't fully ready yet. I was ready, I think. But Emily wasn't fully on board yet. And and because of that, I felt like this, I felt this huge weight um, that if I were to like drag her out of Canada, sell our home, pull our kids out of school, all this, give up our life there, our security, that um, if if it went wrong, that she would hold it against me. And mm -hmm. and I felt all this weight and pressure in that way. And I, I felt like I needed to have her on board. And and so I, although I was reading about, you know, life in Mexico and, and Central America, I was following all these Bitcoiners and other freedom-minded individuals on Twitter who had made the move from different developed countries to to central america and and I, I was contacting them asking them and and i was convinced that we should do this but again i wasn't going to drag her against her will and then so so yeah then some things happen and and i guess i'll let emily uh explain how she came to the decision that you know she yeah. was ready to go um yeah it was probably about a week or two before i was going to be losing my job um based on my choice and they were testing us every day at work and you know if we weren't vaccinated mm -hmm. we had to take the test and anyways i i just i just prayed god you have to give me a sign if we're supposed to leave and go to mexico because mm -hmm. i need to know if this is the right move you know and the very next day after i prayed that i was talking to just a lady in the health food store and she mentioned that some friends of hers had left Canada, sold everything, left Canada, and were living in Mexico, and that they were really happy there. And uh, one important point that Emily forgot to mention was the lady she spoke to at the store was secretly unvaxxed, but afraid to tell people. And right. she was whispering, whispering, <laughs> like yeah. she's afraid for anyone to hear. Like, this is what Canada had become. Yes. People right were on. whispering and afraid to have conversations out in the open. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just so thought I'd mention it. Yeah, and if that, if that ain't like the proof, like, you know, history repeating like in the thirties, but you know, yeah. people don't learn out of history, you know, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very sad. Um, but after that and conversation. Also, also like just as a side note, I had been watching my coworkers who desperately did not want to take this experimental thing um mm. just dropping like flies because of needing to keep their job needing to keep you know the food on the table and the mortgage paid and so many of them were coerced wanted yeah so some of them even tried to find other jobs but nothing you know that would pay as well as being a nurse and so they felt like they had no other choice and i was i was very sad and and I guess for me and, and also for Tom, we realized if our government is going to take away people's jobs, what are they going to do next? Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah it was That's a scary a thought. Yeah. We thought, we thought yeah. it could go down the road of them taking our kids from us. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's funny that people, people in Canada will say, oh, that's irrational. But I mean, people who say got the vaccine and, and didn't face this discrimination will think that we're being irrational. But but the truth is that it, we were in that dark of a place when the when the mainstream media is running polls of should we jail the unvaxxed or deny them health care? Like they were they were talking about banning us from grocery stores, even um, yeah, denying health care, denying life saving surgeries. Health care was of things. starting to be denied. Even like there was a mm -hmm. walk in clinic in our city that yeah wouldn't take they us. wouldn't take unvaccinated people already in September of 2021. Yeah, and so it was already coming in, seeping in in different ways. So, yeah. And, so where were we? So, so Emily had this, she felt like she got this sign that, that we were meant to go and, and there was another sign too, but she came downstairs when I was working and, and she basically like, sort of like grabbed me by the 
shirt collar and was like, we need to do this. We need to go. And this was, this was like October 8th, I believe it was around there mm -hmm. at, uh, 2021. And they had just announced that they're going to put in a travel ban at the end of October, October 30th, we were going to not be allowed to fly. And there's like a one month gray area where we might be able to with a PCR test, but we didn't know for sure it for November, but we were like, we got to get out before the end of October. So after Emily, so sort of grabbed me by the shirt collar and was like, we need to do this. I, I was like, Hey, that weight <laughs> is gone. That pressure of that uh, burden feeling like I'm, I'm taking all this on myself. I was like, okay, she's on board with me. We're in this together. And, and then after that, I was like, okay, let's go. Let's, let's list the house. Let's call the realtor. Let's book the plane tickets. Let's, and then the dominoes just started to fall. And within, you know, three weeks, less than three weeks, we had sold our home. Um, we had sold our car, uh, we had sold a qu quarter of our possessions, <laughs> um, you know, had everything arranged. We had plane tickets booked, a place to stay in Mexico when we got there. Um, yeah. And but so you also lost your job. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's something important to mention to people, because I think there's a lot of people watching who are saying like, well, I would do that, too, if I could, if I could work remotely and if I could, you know, find a way to support myself. Well, I mean, I, I am an accountant um by trade so it helps but i i had to give up my job when we left emily was fired um the company i was working for said they couldn't keep me on if i left the country and you know i just I, and i accepted that they were very good to me they um i didn't have any hard feelings it was just it wasn't a covid related decision it was just uh you know what we our company policies don't allow you to work from another country so but when we left, we had no income, we had no job security, we we had no idea how we were going to make it work. We just knew that it was so important to us mm -hmm. that we would find a way. And I think that's important for, for people listening to know is that if you want to, if you're in a developing country and, and you see how bad things are getting there, which I think a lot of people do, and they're thinking about leaving it's not going to be easy. There's no person coming who's going to offer you a hundred thousand dollar a year job in El Salvador. And that's going to make it so easy for you to, to move and that you're going to find the perfect house that's going to be waiting for you there at the perfect price. And, yeah. and it's not going to work out magically. Like you're going to have to make difficult decisions. You're going to have to decide, do you value your job security, your career, your pension plan, your retirement savings, your house and in, in wherever you're living um, or do you value your personal freedom and and all that comes with that? And and so for us, it was like we value our, our personal freedom and, and the freedom to raise our children the way we want to so much that we were willing to walk away from all that. Mm -hmm. And and it's been a very costly decision financially, um, but also also like emotionally in terms of, you know, walking yeah. away from relationships, family, friends. Uh, I think a lot, um, maybe for women more than men, possibly. Um, I think it's hard with like the social aspect, you know, leaving your social network behind can be very challenging. And it has been for me um, because you're not going to keep those relationships the same as they were when you're back in Canada and you could see all those people every, you know, every few days or whatever. Um, you can't go for walks with your friends back home anymore and you might not be able to keep up with all of them, right? And and you, you can't necessarily. Um, and I think that for, you know, some of our friends and family back home who are thinking about leaving, it's, it's really hard because they have elderly parents or, you know, that they need, they feel that they need to look after and different ties, you know, like they're close with their good friends or siblings or whoever it is. And so, that can be a really hard aspect to leaving as well. But you also have to ask yourself, like Tom said, what do I value the most? You know, and and for us, we had to think about our children's future and our family's freedom, you know. Now I'm still having a hard time, to be honest with you. I'm still, I mean, not only me, but a lot of lots of people that you know or we know to digest this reality, you know, reflect yeah. upon this reality because um you know, until not such a long time ago, let's say years ago, uh, you know, I mean, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, but let's just focus now on Canada. I mean, I've never been to Canada, but from other people's testimonials, uh, stories, 
documentaries. Um, even like it wasn't a documentary by Michael Moore. He went to Canada. He, he compared like the people, the mentality of Canadians and and the people from the U U.S. from the United States. You know, the people in Canada are more let's just say you know and more relaxed. They, they you know they let the door open. They leave the door open. They're more open minded. I would just you know this is just my. <laughs> my reflection now but it's it and and you know and it was always like countries like canada australia like oh these these would be the countries that we would emigrate to you know this is yeah. like shocking to me it's like it's like it, 180 degrees like upside down everything you know it's, it's really horrible it's shocking i mean i'm still having a hard time digesting this whole thing what's going on right now at the rate of speed that it's going on you know it feels like a bad dream, I think, and you just yeah. keep hoping you're going to wake up from this dream and that, you know, things are going to go back to normal. And it's a hard reality to swallow that it's not. It's yeah. not just going back to the way it was. And and if it was, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just, when you were talking, I was thinking about how my grandparents on both sides came to Canada after World War II. Yeah. You know, they came to find a new life, to find more freedom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and now, you know. Like 50, 60 years later, it's it's been turned upside down. So Okay, let's talk about El Salvador. Well, how do you guys feel? Yeah. I mean, the, just the feeling of it, just living there. And I mean, are you guys relaxed and are you optimistic? Is it like, you know, with this whole, let's say, st uh, political structure with Bukele, and, you know, and I talked to, you know, the two people who <laughs> um, uh, from El Salvador that uh, it's, 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 is it is it like is it something that you are this you know striving for you, you can imagine like living for you know for a let's say foreseeable future over there yeah, uh, yeah. one thing I want to mention before we talk about that is just that we we had said we left Canada for Mexico and I just wanted to clarify that we lived in Mexico for over seven months traveling around Mexico until uh we came to El Salvador later oh really? we didn't how was that it was great. We love Mexico. Yeah. Um, and so if you don't mind, I'll just like quickly yeah, yeah, touch yeah. on that. So, so we, um, left Canada. We moved, we went to Mexico, not knowing what we were going to do. We had no residency or anything like that. So we just treated it like uh, a vacation at the beginning. We took our girls and we tried to show, like take them on tourist attractions and visit zoos and go snorkeling and these kinds of fun activities. Ruins. Yeah. And Mayan ruins and all these yeah. things. And, and we tried to treat it like this is fun. This is an adventure, right? Like because they're mm -hmm. they're going through this difficult experience of leaving their school, leaving their friends, all this stuff. And so mm -hmm. it was like, let's make this an, a fun adventure. And yeah. and so we moved around. We traveled like through four states in Mexico, and then um, we ran out of time on our 180 day tourist visa. So we were like, well, what are we gonna do? Either we got a we couldn't apply for residency because Mexico kind of like forces you to go back to your home country to apply for residency and which wasn't an option for us at the time. I mean, you can go to other countries, but but it's pretty hard without going to your home country. And and so we were like, well, we got to go somewhere. And and so that was when El Salvador had dropped the COVID restrictions and they had made Bitcoin legal tender just, you know, in the fall of 2021. And and all of a sudden it was like, oh. El Salvador. Interesting. Because I, I had become a Bitcoiner recently. I was uh, on my way to becoming a Bitcoiner anyways. I was, you know, interested in crypto and reading stuff about it. And and so now we have this interest in going to El Salvador and we, we needed to go somewhere. So I suggested to Emily, why don't we go to El Salvador for a month or two and then come back to Mexico and, and live in Mexico again? And yeah, so we came in May of 2022, this this past year, to El Salvador, and and ended up loving it, and ended up uh, deciding to apply for residency here, and we ended up going back to Mexico and to Canada for my sister's wedding, which is a whole nother story we could get into about our legal troubles with the Canadian government <laughs> uh, because of that visit. Uh -huh. But uh, we ended up coming back here in September to live, and we now have residency and mm -hmm. uh yeah we're loving life in el salvador it is we can see a future here we i mean the, with the the current trajectory of the country if if it continues in the direction it's going we we think there's amazing potential and opportunity and i could i could see us living here for decades if if things keep going the way they are mm -hmm. yeah and as far as the residency we've had a guy jeremy he's from mm -hmm. the state 
And he's been very helpful yeah. for us getting our residency and same with Ryan and Jessica. Um, so yeah, if anybody needs help that way, we can recommend him highly. He's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Cape, yeah. Cape Tool Salvador is the, the company um, that's mm -hmm. helping a lot of our, our friends and uh, fellow expats get residency here. So he can help mm -hmm. you. Um, you can find him on Twitter at El Salvador visas. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing that we noticed when we were here in May and June was that uh, most people, pretty much all the people that you find here coming from, you know, Canada, Germany, wherever they're coming from, um, unless they're like just here to surf for a week or two, they were coming here to explore the freedom and the Bitcoin aspect of things mm -hmm. in El Salvador. Okay. Yeah. So we connected with a lot of great people that way. You guys have a permanent or temporary? Is it, I mean, how does it temporary. work? Temporary. Is that one year and then you can extend it easily? One year and then we have to renew for three years before you right. get permanent. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you could you share a little bit more? Like, uh, let's say you know, I mean, you guys do you, do you guys want to like uh, like have a like uh, have a work like a job or do you want to also establish a business over there? Or yeah, so like right now, so. I had to leave my job, but then I ended up um, getting work with the same company I used to be an employee for. They they contacted me later and asked if I could come back on a contract consulting basis. And so I've been working for them. So I'm a digital nomad. I work remotely. And because of that, I was able to qualify for the independent worker visa. It's like basically a digital nomad visa. Um, you, you just need to make $1,500 US per month. Um, but if you have dependents like uh, a spouse and kids that aren't making income, you have to make, I think, 2,500 US dollars per month to qualify. And so it's it's pretty straightforward. It's not not difficult uh, threshold to meet. Uh, but but yeah, so sorry, what was it? I, I missed the, the question. I got off. Yeah, track there. Uh, because uh, we were thinking because my, I mean, my girlfriend has a she has a shop. She has a you know business. Uh, she. Uh, she's more into, you know, botanical stuff. So we were thinking well, all kinds of brainstorming, you know, like it, it, at that time, you know, like could should we buy a property? Should we rent it? What if we want to establish, you know, a, a business, uh, open up a shop or or a company or or something like that, or maybe go into a corporation? With, so these are all my, maybe just, just two specific questions right now for you guys. Nope. But anything you can like share for, for our listeners, like what? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, yeah. We, do, we know people that have come here. Uh, there's there's two types of visas you can get. One's the digital nomad, uh, independent worker one. The other one is if you want to come here and start a business. Um, and and so I my understanding is it's the same sort of thing, but rather than having to prove income, you you say that you're expecting to make right certain uh, amount of income. And and we know people who've started businesses and you know they're not making any money yet, and they they have qualified for uh, temporary residency with the plan to start a business and and it could be a brick and mortar business on the ground here or it could be uh an online business but that lots of people are getting residency that way as well so if you wanted to come here and start a, a business and doing whatever you want I, I think that's a very feasible option yeah and eventually we have plans to hopefully start sort of like an airbnb yeah on on the property that we're awesome. in the <laughs> purchasing <laughs> yeah so we we recently bought a uh, property like half an acre mm -hmm. uh like in the mountains kind of close to the close to the coast it's a beautiful beautiful spot and and we have this vision of building like rental cabins up there overlooking mm -hmm. the ocean and and harvest coffee or <laughs> yeah if we so, could we could grow coffee there it's the, uh the land has mango trees avocado trees oh beautiful you know, coconut oh, trees it's you cool know. it's <laughs> It's amazing. Like when you come from Canada, cold climate, and uh, you're used to having to grow tomatoes in a greenhouse because it's so cold, and you can only <laughs> grow stuff for four months of the year. To come here, where things grow twelve months of the year, and you know you're just like picking fruit off the trees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it's so nice. It's so like the the potential to grow stuff, grow your own food, isn't mm -hmm. incredible. So so yeah, we eventually want to move to like our own business on the ground here. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, I'm just doing the remote work thing. 
Yeah, we, I mean, we're very nature connected. I mean, we're totally surrounded you know, by forests and there are some mm-hmm. cows we can, we can always see from the, from the other farmers, you know, I mean, we're not farmers, but, but we, we, we do, you know, we do intend to, if we ever establish ourselves in a warm country to, you know, have our own goats and sheep and chickens and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's also our dream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we're on the top of the hill, but, you know, as you said, the climate, you know, the weather, it's just, I mean, I, you know, I myself, I was born in Persia and uh, I came to Austria when I was seven years old. And, but like permanently, like long, long time horizon, I would, I think we all, that we all love, you know, we would love to just live in a country where it's, let's say more or less warm, or I don't, you know, I don't mind tropical or even hot climate. I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, right. Especially, I, I also lived in California for five years. So, uh, you know, that, that makes a whole different, you know, um, uh, perception and, and, and quality of life, you know. Um, so how do you perceive like, uh, because as you know, you know, it's just so much propaganda and by so-called opposition parties and main, you know, mainstream media or, or other, you know, media, how do you perceive this whole, uh, you know, media or, or, because there's a lot of FUD and a lot of lies. Uh, do you feel like, really safe do you do you want to talk about it like what, what's the perception like how do you feel over there i i feel incredibly safe here we've never had a single negative experience where we felt in danger i mean when we first got here i remember feeling pretty uh nervous because there had just been some gang violence a month before we came and and it made the news all over the world and and so we were quite nervous but after a couple of weeks of being here driving around walking around we're like okay it feels pretty normal pretty safe not any different than mexico and we never had any problems in mexico either Mm -hmm. we felt very safe in all the places we went to in mexico um but yeah like uh i feel totally safe we we walk around with our kids and Mm -hmm. you know in the city and towns here and i mean look most a lot of people do live in gated communities. We live in a, a gated community, and there's mm-hmm. security here, so mm-hmm. I mean that helps. But uh, but even like when we go out, we feel safe. I do. I don't yeah, know. Emily. Um. Yeah. I mean, there's probably certain parts of the city of San Salvador I wouldn't walk alone or with my three right. little girls in. You know, but it's the same back in Canada, right? In fact, um, the crime rates here right now are you know, there's less homicides per day than there are in many cities in Canada. So it's amazing. Yeah. 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 Do you Um, have like the trust? uh, Do you, do you feel this feeling of trust uh, towards Bukele and his team? Because this is, this was a question we were always discussing with my girlfriend, like uh, what, what's, you know, what if Bukele is gone? You know, I mean, there is no guarantee for anything, uh, uh, I mean, if I were Bukele and and he seems to me that, that, you know, the person, the human being, uh, with with a different ethos, uh, I, and and if I were his place, I would like okay. My mission would be to make myself and the whole political structure obsolete because by that time, with it being 10, 20, 30 years, there'll be so many like circular economies, Bitcoin cities, so much uh, you know prosperity and abundance evolving that it's just a total different you know uh, evolution. It's an it's an evolutionary stage where. Do you really need the state anymore? Do you need the government, or is it is it going to be all like decentralized? Uh, do you know where I'm going with this? Like, is there a vision for you guys? Um, mm. How this is could there, evolve? So, is there a vision for us as to how, like how El Salvador could evolve? Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I've thought about it that deeply, but like to 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 go back to your original question about like, do we trust Bukele and and that? Um. I don't trust any politicians fully, but I feel like Emily's just going to just wake up the kids and put a show on them so we can continue on after. But um, yeah, so I I don't I don't fully trust any politicians, but but I feel like we're in a in a situation right now in the world where you have to make the best choice you can. And a person can say, well, I wouldn't trust Bukele. I wouldn't trust, uh, you know, politicians in El Salvador. But are you going to trust the politicians in Canada? Are you going to trust the politicians in Europe? Are you going to like where are you going to live? So, you know, I I think you have to make the best choice you can. And and for us, that's El Salvador. And and I I have more reason to trust the government here than I do to trust the government anywhere else. Because at least 
at least they're taking steps in the right direction. They're they're doing good things for their country, right? Like like uh, the country is is safer than it's been ever. It is uh, it's taking like as far as us Bitcoiners are concerned, we think they're they're making incredible strides in in terms of giving the the population access to sound money and also banking the the country that's 70 percent unbanked right 70 percent of people here didn't have bank accounts or still don't and there's they're leapfrogging that legacy financial system that has kept them out of you know out of accessing digital payments and 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 now they're they have bitcoin wallets on their phones and so you know a lady running a pupusa stand here which is like you know their favorite food in El Salvador, who's making a few bucks a day, is able to do digital payments on her Bitcoin wallet, which before she had to operate in cash only. And, you know, and there's risks that come with that. Now you can. So, so, I mean, I feel like what the government's doing here is, is incredible and, and I'm very supportive of it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that I can fully trust them. I, I just, I feel like we have to make the best choice we can. Yeah. So, do you do you think the the uh, the the conditions are right now so mature that it it, it has accelerated this process of attracting, you know, uh, as all you know, Samson Mao, you know, from Gen Three, uh, <laughs> always you know talks about like you need you need to you need to you know let money be money and and you need to uh, you know uh, accelerate the the economy. You know, you have to create the conditions for the economy and and attract investors, entrepreneurs, yeah. uh, capital, uh, talents, skills, uh, talented people, engineer engineers. Uh, scientists uh people in the construction business i mean from every field from every level we can think of uh do you see that do you see that accelerated process of attracting all these people all these you know resources uh, uh the knowledge pool the the talents the skills do you see that yes that i do and uh, i'm glad you you know asked that question in the way you did because it's been really interesting. We've had a lot of gatherings lately, like uh, over Christmas and New Year's and um, metal. We have a fantastic Bitcoin community here, um, both in San Salvador and also on the coast near Bitcoin Beach. Um, but but uh, we had many gatherings over the holidays where I, I was introduced to new people who are coming. And it's incredible listening to the people who the talent they're bringing and the experience they're bringing, you know, just just the, from the it's such varied backgrounds. Right like different healthcare professionals and business people and people who've run restaurants and people who've worked in high up government military positions. And like people are bringing all financial backgrounds, tech backgrounds. There's all kinds of skill sets coming here. And, and I think that all they need, all these people want is, is the economic conditions and the economic freedom to be able to build things and, and contribute uh, positively to a country's future and and all that uh, governments need to do is say like plant that flag kind of like Bukele did where he said I'm planting the freedom flag here in El Salvador you know we're gonna allow you to come here and build your business and not you can set up your business in Bitcoin City eventually and not pay any tax like no income tax no uh property tax no uh, capital gains tax all all these things and and so I think a lot of people are attracted to that. And a lot of talented people are saying, why do I want to live in Canada or Europe and pay 50% of my income and in taxes? And you're getting less and less from these benefits. I was talking about this um, with my sister recently about how, you know, if you're in our position, you you feel like you're not getting any value for your tax dollars. You you uh, are being denied health care in lots of ways, being denied life-saving surgeries. <laughs> Um, can't access certain clinics, can't visit in our province. I believe you still can't visit your uh, sick relatives in the hospital. Um, we don't agree with the schooling system and the agenda that's being pushed. Yeah. So we we pay for public schools that we can't use. Uh, there's all these things that you're paying for. And like, like for instance, we're being um, taken to court by the Canadian government for refusing to give them our personal information when we flew back to Canada. So like Canadian tax dollars are going to pursue court cases against people like us mm -hmm. right and so so more and more you're like what am i paying for why am i giving 50 percent of my income to a an insane government that uses 
that money in this way. And so, so if a, if a government like El Salvador can can create that opportunity for people to come and, and feel that the government's actually working in their interest, um, I, I just think it's it's attracting so many people. And and I think the the wave of people moving here is just beginning because I think the the people who have come so far, although there's quite a few of us, we're sort of the pioneers and and the people who were crazy enough to do it. But now that there's people like uh nikki and james and two people in paradise and and others who are making videos and and podcasts and talking about it and like you know yourself interviewing people here it's showing people outside of el salvador what life is like here and mm -hmm. that that it is safe and it we do enjoy life here we do see a future here and all of a sudden you know what was such a scary thing is now becoming a realistic option for people in developing countries because they see that it's not as scary as their government makes it out to be. So I, I think the future is super bright here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had a lot of people show interest and, you know, uh, reach out to us because mm -hmm. of our Twitter posts or maybe my blog posts and different things. So, yeah, there there are definitely a lot of people in Canada and many other countries that are thinking seriously about leaving. Yeah. And yeah. And I think, you know, because a lot of people, I mean, it's just natural. People have fears, you know, fear of, of the fear <laughs> and, and, and anxiety and, and, uh, you know, insecurities. It just, it's, it's, and, and as you said, you know, in the beginning, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's difficult to, especially if you have interdependencies, you have maybe family to provide for, you have, uh, you know, you have different conditions. <laughs> And then pack your stuff and go to a different country without knowing, you know, what's going to, what is, you know, what, what can you expect? You know, uh, uh, you know, it might be possible. It always realistic, you know, to go for six months, one year, two years, but then you cannot plan ahead. But, you know, for me, uh, my feeling, my perception is that I, I'm totally optimistic. I'm totally with you, you know, with both of you. It's like, I'm so optimistic. And so the, the, the future of, of El Salvador and other, you know, countries who will replicate it in a similar identical fashion, uh, it's it's going to create abundance. It's going to, you know, create exactly that, what also in Jeff Booth always has been preaching about, you know, like <laughs> this this will uh, finally, people will, people, people will have more time uh, they can finally, you know, you can, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm totally for homeschooling, you know, like you, you probably know Daniel Prince. He's like the, yeah. <laughs> the guru of homeschooling. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan of, you know, of, of, of his, of his, you know, sharing his thoughts on, on homeschooling and, and, you know, free the mind of the children, because these are, I mean, if you don't start with the children with their free and creative mind and their spirit and their, you know, let's just say spirituality, even, you know, it's, it's, it's um, maybe even beyond our imagination, what is possible once the generation grows up I and mean, they're going to laugh. I mean, in 10, 20 years, people, you know, the kids are now go growing up, they're going to laugh and, and they're just, they're going to go and, and say, you know, this is, this is crazy. I mean, what, uh, uh, beginning with the money, you know, with the fiat money and the central banking structures and everything else, uh, but uh, because there are consequences to that, right? There are uh, collateral damages, uh, unbelievable collateral damages. And then on top of that, this whole agenda that is being played, you know, in front of, in plain sight, right? With the, whatever they want to call them, WEF, Davos, or, you know, one, <laughs> uh, one world order, or whatever you want to call it. But it's, um, and I, I, I think more and more countries will, will, uh, uh, you know, replicate this model of El Salvador, and that's 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 makes me makes me happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if El Salvador can stay the course, which you know, it being a Bitcoin bear market makes it more challenging, right? Because it's easy for people to sling mud at Bukele and and the government here and say, like, you know, you read the hit pieces in the New York Times, and uh, I'm not that I read them, but I see the headlines posted mm -hmm. that. Big El, El Salvador's failed Bitcoin experiment and all these things. And it's it's so funny to to hear those things and read those things because when you're here on the ground, you're like, okay, they have 25% of vendors in the country accepting Bitcoin. Like, do people not realize how mind-blowingly successful that is? That's probably a thousand times more than any other country on earth. And, and it, it's a huge accomplishment for one year for a developing nation to... Mm -hmm to get that much adoption and and obviously there's struggles there there are lots of you know technical issues and and things to sort out like this is a whole new financial system you have different lightning wallet 
providers and you know uh different hardware wallets and different software wallets and and everybody's tr and interacting with a government app and interacting with vendor software like there's so much so many moving parts here and and somebody described it like it's like a it's like we're trying to you know fix the airplane while the plane's flying that kind of a thing <laughs> right and that's kind of what it is it's yeah it's on the fly where the whole country's learning as it goes and the bitcoiners here get to be a part of it like you get to be there and you get to help the the cashier store learn how to use the lightning wallet so that they can accept your payment and and each of us has a, a part to play in that but it's it's exciting to be a part of yeah yeah it's interesting to think about you know the motives i mean it doesn't matter i don't have to understand that would it be the incentives or just saving faces? Because I think there's a lot of, like, it's a paradigm shift. And then having, being forced to admit that, oh my God, I, I've been wrong. Uh, would it be, you know, in the fiat academic world? I think Safeda Namus is the best to <laughs> talk about this. It just, a lot, I think a lot of uh, saving faces or just incentives, you know? Uh, but um, eventually, you know, uh, the cat is out of the bag. It's just it's just a matter of time until everything, you know, becomes smoother, interoperable, and uh, even you know more efficient, faster, and easier. You know, um, I mean, Jan three is going to come out hopefully. You know, next few months with the new, uh, you know, relaunch of the Aqua Wallet, which which help which even you know our grandmas could uh, you know could could handle you know okay. <laughs> it's going to be that easy you know with it be you know bitcoin lightning stable coin which is again they even admitted themselves it's just a transitory thing and then it will vanish because you won't need it anymore because once eventually bitcoin hopefully going to be the unit of account not only store of value made of exchange but a unit of account and then you think totally different you think in purchasing power and that's going to yeah. be mind-blowing you know then yeah. you will definitely you know uh, be able to whatever in 10 20 30 years to buy a big yacht with 0 0.001 uh, bitcoin so <laughs> and this is what i see in el salvador i think it's going to attract so much capital so much resource so much skills talents brains uh, engineers inventors new mm -hmm. technological innovation which could not be because of all this patent system because of the uh, military industrial complex because of the you know, this compartmentalized structures everywhere. I, I see El Salvador as a country where the a relaunch, a rebirth of all this technological innovation, whether it be energy, transportation, medicine, healing. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, anything you can think of, uh, which we have, which we could have had probably in the last hundred years, you know, because I've, I've been reading a lot of stuff. And even Safed and Amu is going to tell you that. I mean, why are we still having propulsion systems that you know uh, uh, that burn that burn you know that that uh, that have combustion systems? Why why can't we you know travel faster, more efficient, more you know more more clean if you want you know? So I'm 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 super optimistic. This is why you know I'm so. This is why I want to talk you know also have you know uh, uh, listen to your thoughts like. Where where do you see El Salvador with with the people, with the comfort, with the prosperity and abundance, in let's say ten to twenty years? I mean, this is the potential I see in El Salvador and other countries to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I see. I mean, I believe in the future of Bitcoin. I believe um, that the price is going to be considerably higher in five or ten years, and I think that it's it's actually interesting right now being here in a bear market because I think a lot of the local people don't see the value of it they don't see the value of saving it so so the, although they might accept payments in bitcoin it's instantly converted to us dollars on the their wallet and and i don't i don't uh blame them for wanting to do that because like if you're only making five hundred dollars a month or something like that you can't afford volatility right and bitcoin has been very volatile and you know it's been volatile in the down direction over the past what, six months or almost a year so so if you know, if you can't afford to lose 50% of your money in the short term, then, then like people can't afford to take that risk. But, but I see, I see really positive signs happening here. Like one thing I gives me a ton of hope for the future of El Salvador is there's these educational programs that uh, I know of like an organization here called My First Bitcoin or in Spanish to me, Premier Bitcoin. And they go around the country educating high school students mm -hmm. on what Bitcoin is, how to use it, how to download a lightning wallet and and they, I think they give them a few dollars worth of Bitcoin and, and these kids are excited about it and they get it and they are going to be the future, right? So you might have 
some 60, 70 year old uh, vendor on the street who's like, I don't want to get Bitcoin. I don't care about this virtual currency. I think it's a Ponzi scheme. But <laughs> you have this younger generation, right, that's growing up with it and adopting it. And I think they're going to see the value of it. And I, so I think if El Salvador can stay the course, I think that the future is really bright for, and I know some young people here who are already stacking sats and <laughs> starting to save and and see the value of it and and they get it they get that the price goes up and down and there's a lot of people trying to do education here and uh you know we just met uh a few guys last night um we were doing a live stream and i wish i could remember the name of their podcast i think it's called the bitcoin podcast el salvador or something like that and they're they're doing the first that i know of the first uh spanish language bitcoin education mm -hmm. podcast teaching locals about about bitcoin and and why they should you know save in it and and they they just came back here in the last couple of years from China. They were living in, at least the one guy was living in China, right? Yeah, they'd gone there years ago, like yeah. eight years ago, um, but long before COVID stuff right. started happening. But but yeah, there but, there's so many people coming back here. That's that's exciting. That's exciting to watch. Like the the expat community, like people who have left El Salvador, because there's millions of Salvadorans um, living in the United States, yeah. and Canada, and all over the world, and who who fled because times were so bad here, and mm -hmm. and now to see hundreds of those people coming back like it's probably in the thousands we've met yeah. dozens ourselves yeah even who, in this little community that we live in yeah yeah in our community right here yeah. we meet people all the time who speak fluent english who mm -hmm. move back from the united states because they're so positive on what's happening here and yeah. and that tells That's, you so much about yeah. the direction of a country when yeah. when people who could be living in the united states or or in canada are saying hey i actually think it's better in el salvador i'm going yeah. back wow yeah. i mean this is this is like the proof i mean so much encouragement and empowerment yeah when you when you when we hear stories like that yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh so guys i mean um before we wrap up here i mean is there I mean, to go back to Canada situation, I mean, people think, you know, it's like, okay, this is like in Canada, it could happen anywhere, right? All these restrictions and dictatorial measures and everything that's, that's it's mind blowing what's, what's going on. I mean, it's, it seems to be like the, 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 the plan is like to roll this out, right? Globally. I mean, I mean, do you yeah. see like a parallel universe, like a parallel societies evolving, like starting in El Salvador and other South America, Latin American and African countries? Is that, is that what you see maybe? Hmm. I, I hope so. I, <laughs> I hope so I too. Think, yeah. I, I think, um, okay. So one thing I want to mention and let me get back on track here with the, the, hopeful message but but i think it's important to ask yourself like when you see say canada canada's government um doing tyrannical things tyrannical behaviors like like when they froze the bank accounts of the peaceful protesters um and, or the people who donated to to the peaceful protest ask yourself like where were the leaders of your country were they criticizing justin trudeau were they calling him out because Typically, you know, you would expect them if if they don't agree with something that they would call it out and say, "Hey, this is wrong." Mm -hmm. But almost no one. I mean, Bukele was one of the only world leaders that I saw who actually. I mean, there are a few politicians in Europe or other places, but but not leaders, not world, not no, national just, leaders calling no, them out. So excellent. so yeah. so okay. If if you have a similar situation in your country, then what what are your leaders going to do? And I I suspect that you know, similar things will happen in Europe. And and we, we could go on a whole rabbit trail about CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and how those are being developed all over the world. And they're going to give all kinds of power to governments to uh, to basically restrict your freedoms and take them away. And so, so yeah, I would say that if you're in a developed country, it's especially uh, dangerous because it's just so much more advanced down that path. Whereas in a developing country, I think it's less likely to happen. Um, it's just not there yet, technologically speaking. And yeah, and and but as far as like seeing a future of parallel um, societies, parallel economies, I, I really hope that that's the case. And I I don't know that it's gonna be countries that that lead the way like i wanted to mention this earlier like when i went to the adopting bitcoin conference here in san salvador in november there were some awesome presentations from different projects happening around the world so there's there's here the bitcoin is happening like top down right the government is is spearheading it and but it started out with a bottom-up 
movement, right? It was Bitcoin Beach and El Zante that inspired the country to do that. And similar projects are happening. Like Bitcoin Beach has inspired projects all over the world. So in South Africa, in um, Guatemala, in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. uh, there's a the Bitcoin project happening in Honduras and Prospera. There's there's all kinds of projects happening and, and they're happening from the ground up. And this is, oh, I hope that that will inspire similar things like it did in El Salvador, where the government will see the value of that and, and support it. But it may not. It might need to be a bottom up movement. Right. And, and it may need to be just the people doing it kind of, you know, even without the support of their government. And and I think we need to do that. I think we need to create that parallel economy, um, whether or not the government is supportive of it. We need to all of us, all of us need to start using Bitcoin, start sending payments to each other in Bitcoin, start using lightning wallets. And, you know, like if you're transferring 20 bucks to your friend to pay them back for dinner, use use Bitcoin, use lightning. Don't Spot use your bank. Yeah, yeah you're, you're totally right. I mean, just as hodling it, I mean, hodling, yeah, saving hodling, it's, it's, um, that that's a self-explanatory thing to do, right? Because it's a long time horizon. It's a low time preference thing to do, but, uh, we need to interact. We need to transact. We need to educate, uh, and, and make people comprehend. And, and you know, as, and you're spot on it, it. I think it needs both. I think, uh, you know, you know, that, um, uh, Prince Philip of Serbia, you know, the Gen 3 CSO, he always talks about, he's very humble, you know, very, the way he describes, he says, you know, we need both. We need bottom up and a little bit, you know, top down approach. So where they meet in the middle somewhere, the, the way I understand it. And I, I think, um, and you know, talk about CBDCs. I, do you think the CBDCs, because there's already a certain level of awareness, you know, the dangers, the, you know, of, of CBDCs, do you think there's, it could actually accelerate. I mean, think about Nigeria. Didn't they like try to introduce this, whatever their version of central bank digital currencies, their Sango coin or whatever. And then all of a, all of a sudden people like <laughs> flock to Bitcoin. Uh, do, you, do you see like, is that like, uh, does it have like the opposite effect that it could actually accelerate hybrid Bitcoinization? <laughs> hmm. it, it might, but I still think, personally, I th still think it's such a small percentage of the population that, that actually is aware of Bitcoin and understands what central bank digital currencies really are. I really think that like probably 80% of the population is clueless as like, you know, a lot of people are NPCs who are watching Netflix and watching the sports ball game and couldn't care less about what's happening. And if the government tells them that, you know, oh, we had a financial crisis and we're going to fix it now. All you have to do is download this new great wallet app that's going to be super mm -hmm. secure and make everything better for you. And oh, as a bonus, we're going to give you $1,000 when you download your new CBDC app. Yeah. I think 90% of people will probably download it and go along with it. But on the same line, um, I think it depends on the country, right? Because it seems like a lot of people in countries like... Um, you know, countries coming out of communism just in the last 20 years mm. are a lot more awake and alert to Good government point. control. And we've seen that in the last few years that the, the countries that are most resistant mm. to vaccine mandates, lockdowns, all that stuff. Exactly. Are, yeah. yeah they've countries. experienced it, right? They know. They just know what's what's going to come next, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't like, I, yeah, I think Emily makes a really good point there that there might be places that will resist this harder because they they understand. But but like to see the gullibility of Canadians, uh, Australians, New Zealanders and, you know, much of Europe, I, I think it's these places that have had things so good, mm -hmm. so um, yeah. easy for since World War Two, maybe um, th they haven't really had a lot of uh, big challenges to face as countries. And and they it's been easy to trust your government because it's just yeah. been like an upward slope of prosperity and economic growth mm -hmm. and you know, government providing more and more stuff, even though it was through inflation and borrowed money, um, they've yeah. kind of managed to do that, create this illusion of prosperity, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, the piper has to be paid eventually, right? And we're going to see that coming, as I'm sure you know, over the next like five, 10 years, we're probably going to see, um, you know, government's going to have to pay for all these promises that they can't keep through inflation, uh, money printing. And, and yeah, I, my hope is that that will that will uh, accelerate the the move to hyper Bitcoinization, like you said. And um, I mean, yeah, it's just, I don't know how it will pan out. I mean, none of us do, but my hope is that people will wake up as their purchasing power is being destroyed. You hear more and more discussion, even amongst like normal people, about inflation and 
how it's a big concern amongst voters. And, <laughs> and so that is an opportunity. I mean, it's, it's a tough time to orange bill people when the Bitcoin price is down 60, 70% or whatever it is. Um, but at the same time, it's like the people who, um, are willing to hear it, willing to listen, um, you know, open to new ideas. I think now is a time when they might be looking for solutions, right. To protect their purchasing power. And if you can convince them of that long-term, long-term game, right. Of, of why Bitcoin is going to hold your purchasing power long-term and to ignore the short, short-term volatility. I think we have a chance to, to really accelerate Bitcoin adoption. Yeah. And I'm with you with that. The, the, the timing is a little bit peculiar, but, uh, it's because the pain point has been reached in a lot of segments or demographies of, of societies, the pain point of whatever, the loss of purchasing power, the hardship if people are going through, would it be, especially in developed countries? And you said, you know, that uh, this is what I'm, I mean, I'm concerned about, but, but again, it's, I'm, I'm still very, still realistic, optimistic. It's just, we don't need like, you know, a majority of people. We just need a critical mass and I'm I'm totally convinced we we, we will reach uh, you know Bitcoin adoption by let's say 20, 24, 25, at least a billion people. I mean, it, would you say that's realistic? I mean, once we have that, whatever percentage of the Earth's population, if that is that of the Earth, of the eight billion people, I think this is what will trigger the chain reaction. You know, and then we can forget all these people, you know, who are like totally brainwashed, indoctrinated, sitting in front of their TV and watching whatever they were, what were watching and, and being, you know, bombarded with all this, you know, stupidity uh, by mainstream media. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a form of mind control. But uh, even if it's just like, you know, three, four, five percent of the Earth's population, that's it. I mean, uh, would it be in special, you know, zones or countries uh, distributed or not? But is that what you see? I mean, yeah, like I, I, I what, what I thought that came to my mind when you were speaking was like this a billion person, a billion people adopting Bitcoin. I think we are on track. Uh, I've, I've seen statistics that show that we're on track for that. And, uh, but what really excites me is this idea that, okay, we have these Bitcoin local economies developing. So there's El Salvador has a lot of adoption. There's uh, Bitcoin Lake in Guatemala is seeing a lot of adoption. Um, Bitcoin Jungle in Costa Rica. You have these pockets around the world. Uh, the Bitcoin Island in the Philippines, I saw a presentation from them. But think about when these, these isolated local Bitcoin economies start to grow to a point where they're like connected and, and, and interacting with each other. And now you have like a traveler coming from El Salvador going to Guatemala and they're moving from one Bitcoin economy to another. And I think as these local economies grow and, and get bigger, the, that circle widens, they're going to start to overlap. And and I feel like Central America might be the ground zero for where this is happening, because all these projects seem to be happening here. There's talk of Mexico making Bitcoin legal tender. I know it's not that uh, sure yet, but th but there's politicians talking about it. And the southern U.S. and Texas and uh, down there in Florida, there there's a lot of talk about Bitcoin. And so I think that yeah, there's the potential for these local economies to grow and then overlap. And then that's where you see this acceleration when mm -hmm. when those start interacting with each other. So I think I think the potential is huge. Yeah. yeah. Anything you want to add? Yeah, Emily. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, you close yeah, up? I, was just, <laughs> I was just thinking we're, we're actually going to Costa Rica soon mm. um, awesome. for a few weeks. And so, you know, it's exciting to see yeah. what's what's happening there as well. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, there. Uh, who's there? Uh, let me see. Isn't there uh, Francis Pulio from Bull Francis Bitcoin? Pulio, uh, there are quite a few people over there. Even Alex Svetsky. Wasn't it? Is that? Isn't it Costa Rica? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm confusing, but I think there a, a few really prominent Bitcoiners live there, or like permanently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. We're hoping to check out Bitcoin Jungle over there. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I mean, your your pool of uh, uh, inspiration and empowerment and encouragement for a lot of people. Uh, you know, this talk, other talks that you've given interviews. So, any final thoughts or what do you want to uh, what do you want to share? Your again, your Twitter handles, your your blog, maybe even Emily. Um. Yeah, I have a blog, a Substack. Uh, it's called Life Lessons from Abroad, and. Yeah, if, if anyone's interested in following our journey or hearing what we're up to here, you know, about getting residency or anything like that, 
and yeah yeah and i'm uh i'm on twitter i'm somewhat active on there uh my twitter handle is at men's coach underscore tom and uh yeah i i guess um final thoughts i just wanted to oh f- well first off you can reach out to either one of us um on twitter emily's on twitter too i don't know her twitter handle but at emily <laughs> ml or sorry don't worry you can <laughs> contact me and i can yeah we can put it in the show notes Yes. But we'll, we're happy to answer any questions. We Our mission right now is to help as many people um, escape tyrannical governments as possible and live a more mm-hmm. free life. And so anything we can do that, we want to we want to help. Um, but but final thoughts, I, I would just say that if you are living in um, a developed nation, Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, one of these places where you see the government encroaching on your freedoms more and more, um, I know it's a scary thought to think about leaving to to leave friends and family to to maybe make a career change or to sell your house take a chance it's it's a scary thought we know that well we we've experienced it and and uh i would just say that you know you have to really want to make it work you have to you have to decide if if it's the right step for you if 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 it's if personal freedom is yeah is so valuable that you're willing to to sacrifice those those other things and and I would just say that I would encourage you to to make a trip and and mm-hmm. explore other parts of the world while you can, because um, we have that freedom to travel again. Most of us do and to go and check out other places. And I would encourage anybody who's curious about El Salvador or Central America to come and visit and see that it's not scary because the, yeah. the mainstream media makes you fearful of it and we you know we were fearful of coming to El Salvador mm-hmm. but but the people are so warm and welcoming and and you will not feel in danger if you come to El Salvador mm-hmm. and uh yeah I would just encourage people to get out of their comfort zone and go see with your own eyes don't believe mm-hmm. the media because I mean I just read that tra- Canada issued a increased travel warning for El Salvador mm-hmm. <laughs> heightened mm-hmm. risk or something like that mm-hmm. and I think they're trying to scare people away like Canada sees a huge exodus yeah. I heard from a very reliable source that Canada is getting concerned about the increased exodus of Canadians to El Salvador mm-hmm. and so I think that that travel warning was related to that mm-hmm. and and so they're trying to scare you from leaving they want their tax slaves to stay there and continue <laughs> feeding the beast and uh you know you, you need to live your own life and make your own decisions and uh you know not not fall for their propaganda anymore yeah and and also if you're considering coming to El Salvador or, or Mexico or wherever start learning spanish you know exactly. it's, yeah it's, it's a pretty easy language i mean uh, yeah. compared to you know other languages for example german <laughs> yeah. right exactly um there's duolingo there's lots of different ways to learn it but duolingo is just an easy free one to start with yeah. and uh and also get some low fee credit cards if you're going to travel <laughs> yeah and you know, going back to the roots of Bitcoin, I mean, isn't that fa- isn't that fantastic? Just you know, you could liquidate everything, put everything into Bitcoin, put it whatever into your head, or you know, yeah. and just mm-hmm. go anywhere. <laughs> and yeah. you are, you know, you you can't be confiscated, you can't be seized, you can't, you know, you can't be found. You, it's it's like poof, you know, you're gone. It's never been possible in in human history. I mean, this is something people should be really thinking about. You know, when. Uh, when it, you know when the situation gets serious right yeah yeah that's such an important thing i think to emphasize to people when you're trying to educate them on bitcoin why it's important and you know because people hear this virtual money but to, to have that freedom to be able to get on a plane with nothing not even a suitcase exactly. and to have your life savings yeah. there yeah. in your head is an it's an incredibly powerful thing for individual sovereignty yeah, yeah. Well, um, we want to, I mean, we, we, we can't make plans at the moment, but uh, we're really looking forward to meeting you guys in El Salvador. Would it be in one year or in half a year? We don't know, but we'll let you know. It would be awesome if our families could meet. And, yeah, yeah. And, I'd love and, to. You know, I mean, I have a dream. I have a sort of a vision, but maybe we can uh, you know, discuss it uh, sometime privately. Uh, it has to do with sort of a holistic resort. <laughs> um, and, you know, because it, it, it needs, I think people are, the humanity is, is, is now mature enough, you know, to, to go beyond their perception and their consciousness. And, uh, and you know, I think this is the time, uh, it's a paradigm shift, you know, because either we're going into slavery or into pure freedom and expanding our consciousness and empathy and, and uh, civilizational 
evolution, if you want to call it that. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it's so own rabbit hole by itself. So um, um, Tom, Emily, thank you so much again. I really appreciate that, and uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts and your experience and your values, you know, and your um, uh, spirit. <laughs> Yeah, thank so, you so much for having us. Definitely. <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for inviting us on your show. It's been such a pleasure. And you are welcome uh, at our place anytime. If you come to El Salvador, get in touch. We'd love to have your family. Yeah, since you're going to you know, start an Airbnb, we're going to be your guest, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll show you around El Salvador. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Tom, Emily, have a great day. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Ciao.